Well, here we are, episode 33, and uh, well, how time flies, and this is with, um, who do, when did I meet Jimmy, the amazing Jimmy? It was on uh, Tech Futures Masters probably 12 months ago uh, when I went back to dive into study and learning, and uh, I always like to pay credit on where I met, meet people and who that sort of comes through, so Tech Futures Mind Lab um, is amazing, futuristic, I think, um, education platform community and I went back and did my master's and uh, Jimmy came on to uh, at the immersion phase to share a lot about his story and the work that he's doing and it really resonated and um, as we caught up actually last week to um, dive a bit deeper into a conversation and, and what we're doing uh, there's a lot of similarities in regards to the, the love of travel and uh, nomadic in regards to being around and working anywhere from around the world. He's currently in uh, Cabo. Um, Jimmy, welcome to uh, Evolve Conversations. I really look forward to um, diving diving deep into um, wherever the rabbit holes lead us, but uh, awesome. maybe just a quick introduction from your side uh, and your story so far and sort of transiting or transitioning from military, an awesome career there, into the leadership coach that you are now. Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks for inviting me along as well. It's good to twice in a week is um, is, is awesome to catch up. Uh, so <laughs> privileged as well. Um, the transition. Yeah. So I guess, you know, if I think about the, the commonality, the theme of commonality is leadership throughout um, everything I've ever done. Um, but there's been different contexts. So joined the military straight out of university. Um, went through Sandhurst and then my first job was um, the second Gulf War um, and then dilly dallied around the desert doing various bits and bobs for the next five years um, in various countries. Um, got to visit Iraq twice, Afghanistan and the Australian desert, which I was very pleased with. Um, and then decided that I needed to travel. The travel book had been um, well and truly put into place. So I ended up backpacking around Southeast Asia, Indonesia and ended up in New Zealand. Uh, for what turned out to be a uh, the global financial crisis. What I thought was going to be a small recession um, turned out to be the global financial crisis. So the job so that I was looking at in the UK disappeared. And I, as I sort of explored around Auckland, I figured this is a pretty nice place. So I started a corporate career, which spanned uh, just, over, just over 10 years, which ended up with me being the um, GM International for um, one of the ITPs, um, previously known as Unitech, I think it still is Unitech, um, that they're all going through sort of combinations at the moment. And uh, then again, due to that role, was traveling an awful lot um, away kind of you know, once or twice a month up to various parts of the world. And I decided that there were lots of people working in cafes that I quite liked the idea of doing that. So um, tried to work out what I could do with myself that would allow me to work in cafes as well. Um, so set up this uh, leadership coaching consultancy business in 2017, which has just um, exploded as a result of COVID. I think um, what I initially had this dream of was to be able to do a coaching call from anywhere. And people were a little bit resistant to that um, because they wanted to meet you face to face in a hotel lobby or in a, you know, a, a serviced office or something like that. And then COVID just made the idea of a virtual call really, really simple. And so that really opened up the opportunities to, to keep traveling, keep moving and, and keep going. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for, for sharing. And I know we'll, we'll probably come up with uh, Remote here, which is an amazing company uh, pre-COVID. And I think that's only going to explode post-COVID around um, creating community and uh, belonging of people wanting to work in different countries and experiencing cultures. But I suppose I, I'm always intrigued as a pilot and uh it's a DNA that runs through me uh, with military from my grandfather and then, then father, the leadership um, that comes from military. And there's a, a great company called Afterburner Inc. I'm not too sure if you're aware of that takes a lot of the principles around fighter pilots and uh, bringing it out into the corporate space. What, what does sort of leadership uh, mean to you? And has it kind of changed from when you're in the military and, and running big teams and, and the military to running teams at, at Unitech and now helping coach teams better perform and, and get the desired outcomes that they want? Yeah, I think it's interesting, you know, um, the, the lessons I learned in Sandhurst uh, 20 years ago, I still apply today. And there's still things that are, you know, my company sergeant major talked about that come up in my brain every single day of my life. Um, so clearly the brainwashing worked. 
Um, I think there's a misconception of military leadership in that it's all shooting and shouting. Um, and actually, military leadership is reasonably sophisticated in terms of it's heavily based on intent based leadership um, and decentralization of command with people taking their own initiative to achieve an intent or objective. And so, you know, if the objective is Berlin, I'm not going to tell you which roads to take. I'm not going to tell you what happens if you meet an obstacle on the way. I'm going to tell you the objective is Berlin and you need to get there um, at this time so we can do what we said we were going to do. And I think over the years, the, the business leader, the corporate leader has realized that that style of leadership actually has great merit. And so the autocratic or hero leader that we've seen of the 1990s and early 2000s, where the leader's the hero, has all the answers, solves all the problems, is the single point of failure in the team, um, tells everybody what to do and how to do it, the micromanager. Um, I think those days are, uh, uh, well, uh, they should be gone, but they're still prevalent in, in some organizations. But I think the more progressive organizations and the ones I'm lucky enough to work with are truly open to that journey and want to make those changes. And so the luxury of being able to say, well, hey, I've done this for the last 20 years and I understand how it works and I can help you do the same things with some of the lessons I've learned um, is, is a real privilege. Um, and the, the businesses that, that put that into place, of course, see more engagement, uh, higher retention, lower safety incidents, more productivity. Like the, all the measures that you can think of um, are in the green versus those leaders that still persist with that more autocratic leadership style. And, and they're the ones that I think post COVID, certainly with this great resignation and the transition to hybrid work are going to struggle to keep their staff. Uh, and so now I'm starting to put that seed into people's minds for, Hey, can we help you move quickly and transition? So you keep the good people that have kept your business afloat. Yeah, that autocratic and um, yeah, how the, the roller coaster through the, the generations of leadership and um, yeah, I definitely think that autocratic style is, uh, is going to come unpicked, I suppose, after, after COVID and taking some of that military style, I think while well, looking from the outside and watching a lot of documentaries is, is the calmness and, and finding that um, while well, moving from red brain to blue brain um, when there is so much uncertainty and craziness happening, happening around. And that's what's really happening with COVID is there's just so much um, unknowns that um, yeah, that calmness of bringing some of that military type of training to find calm when there's just so much tense stuff happening around and um yeah, leading your own path and, and creating new types of cultures to get to the desired outcome. And yeah, as you said, if it was Berlin, you're not telling people which road to take because right now, no roads have been paved past COVID. Exactly, right. It's all new. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a new baseline starting point. Um, I, I, one of your posts, like I, I, there's probably three or four people that I, I love to follow. And every time a, con a content piece comes out on LinkedIn, I definitely read it. And uh, you are one of those. And um, something that really resonated with me as an entrepreneur um, and haven't been in the corporate space is around imposter syndrome. And I was like, did you experience imposter syndrome in the military or did it start after the military? Maybe a bit of a personal question, but, um, and I really want to sort of dive into that topic because I know right now there's a lot of imposter syndrome that's getting bubbled to the surface um, with COVID in the different ways, people working at home, not having that sense of belonging, safe space to potentially talk about this. So I would love to open that topic. But um, yeah, did you experience a lot of it or is it more closed in the military? Yeah, no, um, oh, crikey. Um, it's probably worth us clarifying what imposter syndrome is. And then, yes, I'll answer that question. Um, and so from, a, from an imposter syndrome perspective, it's that little voice in your head that tells you you're going to fail um, that keeps coming up despite you having potentially been quite successful. And often we find the most successful people are the ones that struggle with it most because they're constantly having to prove themselves. So there's that high performance anxiety and that high niggling and that anxiety that sits behind the scenes that people don't necessarily see. Um, in direct answer to your question, absolutely. Um, I had it in the military um, and through my corporate career uh, at various times. I think probably the story I tell um, is as a young 22 year old turning up in the desert um, in the closing days of Gulf War II, um, having um, to meet the commanding officer for the first time. And he was this enormous Scotsman with a big bushy moustache and a bald head. And he had a sort of penchant for standing with his hands on his hips in the power pose. 
and um, us four little brand new sub, uh, second lieutenants were marched in to see him. Um, and he didn't even know we were coming. You know, we'd, we'd flown in on a commercial airliner into Kuwait, hitchhiked a ride in the back of an RAF pickup to Shibra Airfield. And we kind of wandered around the airfield to try and find our regiment. And his immediate response was, right, well, what do you think you can bring to the party? And, and I'm looking at all these like thousand yard stare, seasoned men. And I'm this like little kid um, who's just turned up in Iraq. And I was like, what am I, what am I doing here? <laughs> like, I'm not, I don't deserve this place. And then he's like, right, you, Mr. Burroughs, you can be in charge of um, taking logistic resupplies into Basra um, each day starting tomorrow, um, which was the most overwhelming a sort of imposter moment. I was like, well, hold on. What if the, what if there's an incident and I don't really know what I'm doing. And I hadn't had any sort of pre-deployment training at that point. I just literally finished my own officer training, um, mm -hmm. arrived in Germany on the Thursday, flew to Kuwait on the Sunday. And by Tuesday I was in, in charge of taking supplies into Basra. So I had this like, oh my God, I need to perform. I need to do this right. Um, and so I did the typical imposter thing, which was to massively over-prepare um, and to basically pull out all the stops and characteristic, there's sort of, you know, some characteristic behaviors that come up from imposters. And one of them um, is the superhuman, the superhero. So I, I, if I was infallible, nobody could find me out. So I learned every grid reference for every junction across Basra by heart. Um, I spent two days programming them into my GPS. So I never, never could let the team down. Um, I would check the loads three or four times before we set off, like just over everything. And I think back now to that, you know, a young 22 year old and the report that I got when I came back from, from Basra was you no, know, Mr. Burroughs did a good job. He was all right. You know, he's, he's destined for greater things. But to me, that report was what a disaster. Thank God he survived. You know, it's a miracle he got through this. Um, because as an imposter, of course, you dismiss any positive feedback because you're beating yourself up for all the things you didn't do. Um, so, yes, I absolutely had it. And then I had it subsequently through my corporate career, you know, standing in front of executive teams as a 25 year old, 27 year old, um, giving a presentation to the board um, and going, why, why am I here? What, what? I don't deserve to be here. This is, I'm not good enough for this. Somebody's going to go, why is he here? Get him out of the room. You know, all those feelings you have and just overwhelming. And it took me until probably 18 months, two years ago to go, I actually do have a place and I am able to add value. It doesn't stop it bubbling up. It still comes back every now and again, um, but I'm able to, to deal with it and control it by paying more attention to my thinking, by being a little bit more in control of my mind. And that's what I use to create the imposter cure, which is one of the, the, the short courses that we put people through now, which is how do you get your head around your own, get out of your own head, to get ahead essentially it's like how do you control your thinking control your mind control your breathing um and see the reality for what it really is versus what your little voice is telling you yeah, yeah. thanks so much for sharing that um that personal story and journey as well because uh yeah obviously on the other side as an entrepreneur it's um yeah having success at such a and i know you talk about this in your your post as, as a young age um in my 20s and having a 10 million dollar turnover company and kind of going well hang on I dropped out of school and giving you all these negative little purple parrot I call it on my shoulder and it's uh, had to do a lot of homework and work to kind of know that it literally is that purple monkey and you can kind of tame it if you like and, and put it in that uh, scenario where it can go and be happy over there it's still going to be there as you said and I I find it quite a nice check-in when it starts to talk you can have a conversation back to it and go is is this actually ringing true and um, where are these statements actually coming from so yeah I think some of the tools that um, you could share around um, obviously do a, a short course on the imposter syndrome cure but um, just for some people out there that have got this bubbling to the surface at the moment what what would be a sort of three points that they could just do a quick check-in to kind of get this little purple, purple monkey at bay yeah, great question. Um, it's interesting. We, we talked about this this morning with, with a, a group that I was working with, and we, we did do the basic three steps. Um, the first one is to, is to label. Um, and so what we imagine is like this, you know, like the diner sign you used to see in the kind of American sitcoms. Um, and it's like flashing with neon diner, diner. When instead of saying diner, it says imposter moment. And so you see that happening in your mind. You go, oh, my God, I'm feeling the imposter moment. I'm going to imagine the sign. 
And by imagining we move out of our limbic brain into our rational brain, and we start to be a bit more creative with what we can come up with as a solution. So we're starting to de-escalate cortisol and adrenaline levels, and we're starting to think a little bit more rationally. So that's the first step is labeling. Oh my God, I'm experiencing an imposter moment. Okay, I know that's happening to me. Second step would be to realize that everybody else in the room, chances are they're not out to get you. This is just in your head. Um, so being, again, if you can put your rational brain on and go, most of these people want to hear what I've got to say. Or um, I've been asked on this podcast because somebody thinks I'm interesting enough that other people might want to listen to it um, or anything along the lines of that, you know, justification of yourself um, and basing that on evidence. You know, I have delivered good results previously. I know I'm quite capable. Uh, I have value to offer whatever it is that you need as your statement. Um, and everybody else, everybody will have their own statement. Um, the third piece is how can I show that value? How can I show what I have to offer in the most positive way? So whether that's what would the really confident person do? What would the confident version of me do? What would somebody who I admire do? And you emulate what they're going to try and do. So even if it's best version of you, how would the best version of Jimmy give this podcast? Um, how would the best version of Jimmy or a really confident version of Jimmy stand in front of this board? How would he say it? What would he say? How would he present and put yourself into that character. And slowly over time, the more you become that character, the more it becomes your reality, of course, um, because it's a, it's a muscle that you're practicing and you're leveraging. So yeah, they're the three steps is label, um, rationalize that it's not real, this is in my head, and what was the best version of me? How do I show my value? That's, uh, that's so great. And as both of us are like, I, I went through your LinkedIn profile and I think it took me 20 minutes to scroll to the bottom. I was like, crikey, this uh, Jimmy's got a toolbox and a half. And um, it's something that I love to lean into is uh, instead of doing sort of the, the longer courses, like, hey, the Masters is a fantastic program, but picking up all these little toolbox that can help in the scenarios of, of life and business and relationships. And um, yeah, whether that's... Uh, going diving and learning i know you've got your open water dive license to travel around the globe in the 68 countries you have and there's there's certain mechanics that we can pick up from that certification and take it into another area or six sigma or appreciative inquiry so um i love just being able to pick up toolbox and share it to the audience and simple imposter syndrome those three tips um here's a bit of a tricky one um leadership like what is well it's not a tricky one but what does leadership mean to you and what would you challenge in typical leadership styles and that you're kind of wanting to bring forward in, in your work and I think what is super cool is your lens that you have globally like so often we get stuck in our environment of the way leadership is done generally in New Zealand but with you traveling around the group uh, around the globe and setting up this amazing business pre-COVID which now is normal right pre-COVID it wasn't normal traveling around the world and that was you're kind of on the sphere it's eccentric you're getting <laughs> yes, you're getting a lot of different lenses around leadership styles and seeing what's working what's not so what's leadership for you and what would you like to challenge around leadership yeah, great question. You know, again, if I go back to my Sandhurst days, there's a book that every officer cadet has to read in their first term called Serve to Lead. Um, and it's it's by Field Marshal Slim. And it's it's a really, you know, it's an old school book, but there's some great lessons in there. And I think, you know, the, the modern day version of what I would draw from that is that leadership is a gift and a privilege, um, not a right. And so if you're a leader that relies on your job title or your seniority or your position to get things done, um, then potentially there's an opportunity for you to revisit your leadership style in, in search of other ways of leading. And um, on the, the uh, Be A Better Leader program, BBL, we, we talk about um, service in leadership and service is an acronym um, with each letter that stands for sort of a component of leadership but the, the key piece that overarches service is that it's a bilateral agreement with the people that work for you. They are seeking something from you as much as you are seeking something from them. And probably now in the modern context with the transition to hybrid and post-COVID workplaces and, and all this, employees are looking even more for what can you offer me 
um, as much as I'm prepared to give you 40 hours of my week, 50 hours of my week, 60 hours of my week. Um, and so leaders that kind of have this expectation that, well, I'm the boss and you're the employee and you have to do what I say um, because I'm the boss are missing opportunity and are missing um, upside versus that leader that if we take the S of service, which is about safety, um, how do I make you feel as safe as possible in your workplace? And how can you as an employee make me feel safe as a leader? Um, let's have a conversation about that. Um, now, whether that's physical, i.e. health and safety, or whether that's psychological safety, um, both are really pertinent, right? Um, especially in the modern workplace. So I think that the, the key pieces to take out of that are, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege and a gift. Um, it's not a right. And the fact that you need to invest as much time in seeking to offer value to your employees uh, as much as they are to you. Yeah, because I, I, I think it was a part of your research that you shared just, but but the the amount of movement that's happening within top level positions around corporate right now, it's um, one, there's a, uh, if we use New Zealand for an example, is that we just don't have the brains coming, the brains coming back into New Zealand and there's just this skills gap. Um, so people are literally, uh, well, definitely the millennials um, are moving for the big pay rise and but then there's the other ones that are happy to stay because culture is super rich and they're they're giving that safety in conversation so there's literally this push and pull happening a circular Completely. around new zealand at the moment and um yeah yeah i, I mean uh, there's three pieces of great data that kind of paint that story there was a the microsoft report um we said that 41 percent of people are thinking of changing jobs in the next 12 months um then there's the gallup uh, latest research, 2020 research, which says I think 74 or 76% of people are actively disengaged, um, which is a scary number. And then a similar piece of research from Gallup, which said that um, it takes a 20% pay rise to coax some, it takes more than a 20% pay rise to coax somebody away from a bad leader. Um, it keeps next to nothing to keep somebody if you have a good leader. So yeah. it, the cost of losing somebody is not only that pay rise. Um, it's also having to pay market to recruit somebody else and the opportunity cost to your business of not having that person there. So surely it's worth investing in leadership development right now to, to make your leaders better for your business. Um, surely it's worth investing in developing yourself if you are a leader so you keep the best of your team. You know, that's going to be returned 10 times over versus having to recruit or lose somebody. Yeah, yeah great stats. And um, for someone, well, in New Zealand and Australia, I, I find it um, interesting. It's like we'll, we'll invest in so many different aspects of our business, whether it's uh, in corporations, marketing, sales, growth, and it's still the tail end of investment into people, uh, people, policies, culture, everything, and most importantly, self-development, whether that's personal outside the the workspace of nine to five, but they should be integrated in regards to like development as as a leader. It's still, as I think we talked about, it's like in New Zealand, coaching is still one of the most underpaid spaces globally, but yet we probably need it more than um, anyone uh, on the planet right now. <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, so what's something here yeah, you'd really like to challenge in the in the leadership space? to move move the needle in this new direction to forge new pathways because post-COVID is is completely new and, and you've been able to experience what work is going to be like for a majority of organizations with um, bringing, our, bringing a team together globally because we don't have all the talent in New Zealand. If we're just using New Zealand as an example, is that how do you really get engagement as a leader from a global remote hybrid workforce so what a yeah a couple of questions in there yeah no and there's a couple of pieces to unpack um two key things came to mind um, one of them was the the idea of communication with your staff um, i remember in early lockdown one in new zealand there was a statistic that came out of america that 43 percent of employees hadn't even been asked by their boss how they were doing two months into the lockdown um, so let's, let's go to the opposite end of that scale. Let's over communicate with our people. Let's talk to them as frequently as possible. Let's create 
opportunities for them to connect, um, whether that be the in-person when you can, or whether that be the virtual, which is going to be most of the time, right? Um, and there's a couple of strategies that we've, I've suggested. And I call it, how do you bring a 4D context to a 2D environment? Um, so we have these screens, 2D screens in front of us, but how do you add some depth to the conversation? Um, so you're digging a little bit below the surface and how do you add some emotion and feeling the fourth dimension to those conversations? So it could be something as simple uh, as taking a 60 minute meeting and maybe keep making it 45 minutes long instead and ring fencing five to 10 minutes at the start for people to arrive late, for people to set their kids their homework, for people to feed the dog, to let the postman in, whatever it needs they need to do, um, and ring fence those five to 10 minutes at the end for people to hang around and have a conversation. Um, those people who need to dash off, you're giving them the luxury of some time back before their next meeting to do the thing they need to do so they're not late for their next one. Um, and, not, and nine times out of 10, you can get everything in. So how do you create those opportunities to connect as people? The other one is, was a really, um, really interesting piece of uh, research I read from, I think it was Adam Grant, um, who said essentially get rid of old fashioned performance management. Um, and I really like this one. I've been, a, I've been a bit of a heckler of HR process for a long time. Um, a lot of HR functions get in the way of their business and just create administration and noise when people are trying to make money and do stuff. So take out those HR processes that are um, burdensome and cumbersome and replace them with agile conversations. And I don't mean agile with a capital A, I mean agile with a small a. But um, you know, if you were to just have one quality conversation with each member of your team each week with some coaching questions, um, and I provide a coaching, uh, I provide a great one-to-one -one format, which is just four questions and you can build from there. Um, but if you could just do that once a week with everybody in your team, you'd see things improve um, as opposed to filling out spreadsheets and long forms on big CRM systems that people read once a year. If you have that continuous, constant, regular communication weekly, uh, you pick up the things that you don't see when people aren't in the office. Uh, and this has become really prevalent with people who are struggling with mental health issues is that their boss doesn't know because they don't see each other often, often enough. And you can rally for a web, web call. You can, you can rally for a Zoom meeting if you're feeling a bit down and then you can retire to your bed straight afterwards. So have a great conversation where you dig a bit deeper, go that little bit deeper, add, dig into emotions and feelings, that 4D world by having a regular conversation and creating opportunities for that to happen. I absolutely um, love that. And obviously on the my screen here, I've got a, a few articles that, that you've written as well to kind of make as, as reference. And I'll put that these links in so people can view afterwards. But um, yeah, I love the 4D and for me, emotional intelligence. And that's the work that I've been doing the last two and a half years. And it's kind of been trans, transcribed into the work that I do is like, how do you create psychological safety in, in an online space from creating live events, conferences, summits, retreats, and being able to foster that and grow that in a in a, a environment like Fiji, where we have 200 business leaders, we can create that over four or five days. But how do you create that rapidly in the Zoom space? And I feel like COVID has been able to give us this tool, these technology tools that um, can create safe spaces and we can get people together on a zoom call very quickly whereas sometimes to get people in the room can take weeks if not months in organizations and having that simple check-in tool like i use a one to ten scale it's like 10 you're absolutely having the best day of your life one you're absolutely flat and hey need help and having that sort of chat bar on the side it's like and you can literally get a visual representation very quickly about where's everyone sitting and that then flows into the what's the next 45 minutes are we going to talk about how we're we going to grow the company when everyone's sitting a two or three or are we just going to go right how do we get everyone to a five or a six to then be there for the next so but i love your um are you swimming against the covid current and just a, a color representation like a traffic light right and and that's even simpler right it's like are you drowning red floating are you orange <laughs> treading water is yellow just waiting to try and wait for the break or are we swimming and i just love that color representation again i might borrow that and uh and share that to uh the audience yeah please something do. again and something again with new zealand and um 
we're part of some amazing networks and communities globally. And coming back to New Zealand, I, I, the number eight barbed wire, which has gotten us so far and, and to fix things um, as quickly as we can with as least amount as we can to just have it break further down the, the cycle versus, so we're constantly looking for problems to fix versus amplifying this, what's actually working. So yeah, what, what would you say around, uh, you've got an article, how do you deal with, employees that bring you problems how do you switch that and go how how do you deal with employees that are bringing the best to the workplace and how do you amplify that and i'd yeah love to get your thoughts on amplifying the positive versus having a lens of always trying to solve problems yeah great question and um, it, uh, it's fascinating you're being quite timely in some of the things i've been working on i was yesterday working on a program around um how do we develop curiosity um, and we know that curiosity is one of the great amplifiers of innovation, of engagement, um, and many other things. And, you know, I keep going back to it's as simple as having better conversations. Um, lead, like leadership is not difficult if you have good conversations. Um, the challenging piece for leaders who, oh, well, if I go back a step, um, those leaders who have good conversations are probably not the ones that need to focus on having good conversations because they're already having them. The leaders that have low trust, low curiosity, low innovation, low engagement, and really need to have those conversations are probably the ones who are not having them and don't think they're important. Um, so it's really turning on to the commercial upside is the lever you can pull with some of those leaders around saying, well, hey, did you know that if you start having these conversations and start engaging your team a bit more and start seeing some innovation, these measures, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, are going to go skyrocketing and you'll see the commercial results hit your bottom line. Um, how do you amplify um, quality leadership? I think there's an opportunity for senior leadership in organizations to identify those leaders who are doing a great job and celebrate them, um, to invite the more skeptical leaders to see the difference in action. Um, it's almost like a contrast and compare without being, um, what's the word, uh, derogatory or like dismissing what they're doing, but encouraging them positive. These are the things that you're doing well. Here's something you could try that would, be, that would make your leadership style better. Um, why don't you try inviting your team to contribute to the ideas? Uh, the other thing you can do is you can target pain points. So uh, wouldn't uh, no, are you completely overloaded? Wouldn't it be nice if you could delegate a few of those things to get some of them off your plate so you have a bit of headspace so you can work a bit harder? Here's a really great tool for delegation. Um, oh, but by the way, your team are really overloaded as well. Um, so you can't delegate anything to them right now because they're all maxed out too. Okay, so here's a really good tool. You can have a conversation around what should we stop doing as a team? So they're all just conversation tools, really. It's about better chats. Um, with a bit of depth, yeah. with a bit of quality. The, the, uh, it needs to literally be a schedule. Like we all live off our calendars, right? And uh, from a product of, productivity piece, but uh, it'd be nice to have like this yellow at least once or twice a week that's uh, real conversations, better conversations. And it's literally in our diary and that one hour is where we go a bit deeper versus um, the width wise. So um, mm. as you said, it always comes back to the conversations and the type of questions that we're we're asking versus yes no questions it's like let's and that comes back to your rok post um which is an amazing day that um again are you okay yes no how do we do, how do we dive deeper and again yeah, how are um, you really <laughs> let's how dig are a you bit really more. doing today dig a bit deeper um i like how you gather people when i i dive deep into Priya Parker's work, the, the art of gathering. And um, I feel in a time of this disconnection of people in the physical space, how do we bring people together to grow and have this community connection? And I know you created an awesome community for 12 years around um, past military personnel UK and New Zealand. And then I feel like you, you then was searching for another community and you found remote gear which was this platform maybe you want to share a bit about that journey because i feel like it's going to frame um how you've really thrived some people have 
stayed on the three lines, the, the red line during COVID or the yellow, or as you said, you're swimming, you're on the green line, because I feel like remote year had a part of setting you up for success in one of the areas around being able to travel globally. So share a bit 100% about that. Right. Yeah. Um, so I, I think I mentioned at the start when I was um, doing my Unitech role, I um, had the opportunity to travel a lot and I'd be dialing into meetings from all over the place and I would see these people in cafes and I thought, hmm, I, I quite fancy a bit of that. I don't like going to the office every day. I'm an introvert, so I like to be away from people as much as possible and then kind of dip in, do my bit and then dip out and recharge uh, as opposed to being constantly surrounded by, by questions and noise. And um, so when I left New Zealand and headed off to do a bit of backpacking, what I was really searching for was how do you nomad? How do you do this nomad -y thing that people are doing? Um, and it was a bit of a foreign concept to me. And so in the, in the vein of being a born learner, which is something that I've had as a, um, a, a fuel or a passion for a long time, I was like, well, if you need to learn something, you immerse yourself, you surround yourself with these people. Where do I find as many nomads as possible? Oh, um, there's this program you can go on where it's full of nomads called Remote Year. And there are other brands. I'm not sponsored by Remote Year. So there's Wi-Fi Tribe and there's Nomad Escape and there's, there's heaps of other Nomad Cruise. Um, but Remote Year was the one I landed with um, as the community. And I ended up being um, getting to know the CEO and, and the COO quite well over my time on Remote Year because, again, I was learning how it worked. And then I was going, and could we do this? And could we do this? Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's options and ideas that bubbled up as I was on the on the on the on the experience. So I signed up just for a four month experience um, through Latin America. And during that time was just blown away by um, not how behind we are in New Zealand, but maybe how closed we are to different ways of operating and running businesses. So it's majority are Americans on remote year. There were a few others. There was a Croatian and a couple of other nationalities on my program. Um, but to learn, you know, there's a Chrome plugin for everything. Um, the power of Gmail, using Zoom as a native two and a half years before most people knew what Zoom was, um, mm -hmm. just all these tools that you can pick up that make, the, make being a nomad easier. And for me, when you're successfully nomading, people shouldn't know that you're not in the next room. Um, it shouldn't be an inconvenience. And it was fascinating. I had a, guy, a, a conversation with a, uh, a managing director in Scotland this morning. And he was like, oh, I didn't realize that you lived in Mexico. I thought you were just somewhere near me because, because you work with somebody I know. Um, and I said, no, no, I'm fully in Mexico, I promise. And he was like, well, I would never know. The way we talk and the way we operate is as though you were on the same time zone. So to me, there's that. For me, that's the measure of success is that nothing should look like it's out of place. There's a slight danger, and I just want to caveat that, with um, managing people's hours and times and workloads, that people shouldn't be expected to answer emails or respond on your time zone. They should be responding on their time zone. But on the whole, what I try and create is an experience for the people I work with that I'm available when they need me. Um, I'm able to service their, their, their program or the, their individual coaching um, as they need it on the time zone that works for them. Um, without massively impacting on my own lifestyle. And so to go back to kind of the second half of your question, which was, and so what did I learn along the way and how have I put it into practice? Um, realistically, it was uh, the taking the skills I had learned and packaging them into a format that was consumable via a, a virtual medium. That was the, probably the biggest lesson I learned. Uh, and so learning how to do an immersive workshop uh, on Zoom that isn't just a meeting like this, but has got slides and has got me using a whiteboard and has got multiple cameras and has got a, a truly like level up experience. That was probably the biggest lesson I learned on remote year, as well as that complete openness to living in a city with we move, we've got three days to get up and running and then we're back to work. So we need to know how to orientate ourselves, be flexible, lean on the local team, absorb the culture, take opportunities, you know, so many kind of global citizen lessons that I've just loved over the last four years. Yeah, and thanks so much for the share, because for someone like Wonder and Wander is our organization, Wander is the, um, is me, I just love to wander and travel. And that opens like people are like, where do you get your ideas? Some people get their ideas in the shower, going for a run. For me, it's when I go to new environments so uh, overseas and and your peripheral vision starts to open it's like i think i wrote 
when, when you get off a plane at a new airport or destination you haven't been to, you're never on your phone getting off that plane. You're looking out the window, looking at what's new, what's different, what can I learn? And um, I feel like remote here, and again, not plugging them, I have, but I do know they are one of the most professional run organizations and that kind of qualifies by the the amount of venture back capital they've got because people saw this as this new opportunity. But um, in New Zealand, we think nomad or wander or curiosity is maybe getting lost. Whereas in America, as you said, like people jumping on these, um, the word nomad as well, these guys are doing something awesome. Congratulations, you're, you're curious. So yeah, I love that. Um, Interesting. And I think secret. I think a lot of it's geography based as well. I was I was really reflecting this a couple of years ago, and I came up with the fact that in New Zealand, if you want to go and meet somebody and they live in Wellington, where you just hop on a plane, it's only forty five minutes, and you can be there. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas in the US, if they're in LA and you're in New York, which happens a lot in a transcontinental um, meetings happen all the time, it's expensive and it's far. So things like telecommuting, which is the pre nomad nomading. Um, became a lot more popular and acceptable and businesses have had a longer runway for them to trust their employees and I think that's you know probably the crux of what's going to be successful for your workforce if you're a leader or for your boss if you're a, you know an employee uh, is that you need to work hard on trust and the constituent components of trust to make sure that your boss doesn't think that you're in your pajamas watching Netflix and to make sure that if you're a boss, your team um, doesn't feel like you don't know what's going on with them and you haven't got their backs and you're not sharing information and communicating with them effectively. Yeah, I love that. And I love the caveat that you put on this as well, right? It's not just a simple, right, where you go, go travel the world and we expect X, Y, Z. It's actually a whole new format that needs to kind of, you need to get some structures and boundaries in place. Otherwise it can go pear-shaped. And then it doesn't work for either, right? So um, thanks for that. Um, with working um, solo, well, obviously you've got a team, but how do you find that sense of belonging, inclusion and community? I know we've kind of shared a few communities that we're, we're both in or looking at being part of, but yeah, how do you get that sense of belonging when you're traveling and constantly in your environments um, to get your community of people that you can reach out to? Yeah, I think that's a really important thing to bring up. So thanks for for highlighting it. Um, I mentioned before I'm an introvert. So for me, I have to be, I have to, if I imagine I've got five gold coins at the start of the day, every person I interact with takes a gold coin from me. So I have to be very selective with where I put my energy until I can recharge. And so choosing communities that can add value to you is, is so, so critical um, as a nomad because it's really easy to get lost in, lost in the party scene especially if you're going to some of the sort of co-working hostels that, um, that are out there. Uh, so choosing, and, and it's that kind of, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with, being selective on who you spend your time with. I'm super lucky that my partner is also a nomad. So um, we get to interact with each other and keep each other topped up with kind of new ideas. She's a uh, experience manager for weddings and events. Um, so she's always interacting with new ideas in the weddings and events space, which I can leverage for my workshops. Um, yeah. And I've always having conversations about you know, new applications and new things I'm coming across that I can share with her. So we fertilize each other there. Um, but the other places I dig into is actually with my clients. And that's why I think I love working on four continents, um, because I get to interact with people globally. And I'm hearing four lots of news stories that are going on, four lots of weather reports that are going on. Um, and four lots of ideas from a national identity um, or more than four national identities, but, you know, four continents worth of ideas that uh, you can mix and match together. So if I hear something amazing in Asia that I'm like, wow, that would work really well here, I can drop that in and it's instant value add. Um, So I try and work either in a mastermind group or um, join a coaching community, be in a LinkedIn group, be in a Facebook group, um, or be a physical group. So there's an expats group in Cabo, which I've just joined, and it's full of small small business and entrepreneurs and startups living in Mexico um, who are finding their way. What a great place to test some of my ideas and see what lands and what doesn't land. That's how I fertilize myself. I love that fertilization. That's awesome. How do we fertilize versus filling buckets of new, yeah, a new lens? Um, thanks so much for uh, the 45 minutes that um, you've given today and, and the wisdom 
not only to leaders, but um, entrepreneurs, personal, like a lot of this can be taken into whatever bucket you would like to fill or needs filling. So um, thanks so much for all the wisdom shared. And um, yeah, what a, what a great story to be able to travel around the world, helping impact leadership from wherever you are. What would be the, the lasting thought that uh, you'd like to share right now? Frankie. Um Put me on the spot what, what now. Are you most <laughs> what, are you most, what are you most excited about right now? Most excited about um, working hard on finishing a book, which I'm really excited about. Um, mm -hmm. It's going to be a, like a how-to guide for being an experimental leader, which I'm super excited to, to get out. And that should be done by Christmas. We're pushing really hard to get it on shelves by Christmas. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm very excited to get back home. I've been away from, from our condo for a couple of months now. Um, so I'm looking forward to settling back in next to the beach and enjoying the sunshine. Um, we're in rainy season here in central Mexico, so it's been a bit of a change of scenery, um, but I really enjoyed that. Um, and I'm excited to have conversations with people. Um, you know, if anybody wants to reach out either on social media, LinkedIn, Jimmy Burrows, or on Instagram, Jimmy B Leadership, um, would be with no pressure at all other than just to you know talk leadership i'm a complete leadership nerd so if you want to talk about um help or ideas or conversations or want some resources then just reach out and if if i can help of course i will fantastic jimmy burrows thank you so much mate really appreciate it likewise thanks for the invitation i really appreciate the time